thank all of you for attending this webinar where we're going to be discussing Brookline's global, global first in that it's the first to get through a court and into uh, enactment and implementation of a tobacco-free generation policy. I would love to begin this uh, conversation by introducing my esteemed guests. We have with us Professor Catherine Silbaugh, a professor of law at Boston University and an elected town meeting member for Brookline, Massachusetts. She was one of the sponsors of the bill that has ultimately gone through the democratic process of being voted into law in that uh, town. And with us, we have Mark Gottlieb and Chris Banthan from the Public Health Advocacy Institute at Northeastern University School of Law, who were instrumental to the legal defense for this, uh, this ordinance when it went before Massachusetts courts and succeeded. And with us as well, Kelsey Romeo Stuppy from ASH, Action on Smoking and Health, herself the expert on many aspects of tobacco control policy at the local and global level, as well as in particular for this conversation, end game and tobacco regeneration policies. So we're just going to start by diving right into what this is. And I would love to invite uh, Professor Silball and Kelsey as well, if you uh, feel the opportunity arises to just jump in to really just explain like what did Brookline do? Um, okay, uh, Kelsey, I'm going to go ahead. Thank you for inviting uh, me here. And Neil, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, this tobacco-free generation, like an ordinance, we call it a bylaw, in our town, um, it, it's a term, tobacco-free generation is a term, but, the, but what it actually is is a birth date restriction. And if I, if I could get everyone to substitute the term birthday restriction, I would, um, but that's what it is. If you're born after January 1st, 2000, you will never buy tobacco in the town of Brookline, Massachusetts. So that's what it is. Um, and um, it's, it's easier for uh, sellers to enforce because they know what the date is. The date isn't changing every day. And um, it doesn't do much work today and tomorrow, but it does work over the course of years, I think, um, and probably not even, not even many years, but five or 10 years, it would do substantial work. Um, Okay, so let me just talk briefly about, um, about how this we came to pass this. Brookline is a town, but most people would think of it as a city if they weren't interested in municipal government. Um, it, it has 68,000 people. And if you looked at it on a map, it's like a borough inside Boston. Um, so it's, it's urban, um, relatively urban. Um, and we have a long, long history of tobacco control um, innovation, and that's really relevant to uh, arriving at the um, tobacco-free generation birth date um, bylaw. So that history goes way back to sort of first to limit tobacco in restaurants and, you know, raising ages to you know, 19 in, in drugstores and so forth, um, limiting it in drugstores. But we had, within the last several years, we had fought very big and successful fights to remove flavors from uh, retailers. And so the memory of Brookline as an important tobacco control town was refreshed in the minds of, of lawmakers in the town. And that was important. Um, and for those, we had had a lot of opposition um, from industry and, and so forth. But once we passed the flavor restrictions, we didn't have any litigation. We had slightly less opposition while we were passing the birth date legislation, but I think it's a testament to how important birth date legislation can be that there was immediately litigation. I think it's a, it, it's a complete testament to the significance um, to the tobacco industry. I should add that smoking rates are very, very low in Brookline. Um, so the kind of public health benefits versus imposition balance uh, makes it a little bit easier, makes the ground a little bit softer. Um, and we also don't have that many retailers. We have about 20 retailers um, and that number can't grow due to some prior work. And most of them have, you know, are in convenience stores or gas stations. 
So, um, so there were a number of reasons why, even though they did object, uh, it was a little bit easier to bring it through. I want to say that um, a couple of things that I think um, well were particularly important to us. One is Mark, which is to say that um, you know we have this odd form of government where um, we elect 250 people to serve as the legislature for 68,000 people, and we're the ones. So, like a city council times you know uh, 40, and. Um, and so these are like citizen petitions. So you didn't need, you know, um, you you can't quite capture people politically. You, it's hard to lobby as an industry, individuals in town meeting in quite the same way. It's not like it can't happen, but it's a little bit different. Um, moreover, if we do pass something, the attorney general of the state needs to confirm that we really have the right to do it. And since Mark is gonna talk about some of the legal issues that arose, but we knew when we had her approval, we were off to a good start in terms of what the legal issues were. But also before we filed this, we met with Mark and Mark's organization, you know, was interested and agreed to help the town in this litigation without which I think this would have met a harder fate because we talked about that during the deliberations in the town we said you know the public health advocacy institute has has said that if we are in trouble for this they're going to help us with it so which was important we also had the help of a long there was a, a somebody who works with all the municipalities in across the state and he was a great advocate on the tobacco restriction stuff he's retired now but we did have his help too which was very very useful um I think if I were to say what I think is so powerful, so, so powerful about a birth date restriction, it's this. Um, it can, it could separate the tobacco industry from the more sympathetic players. And I consider the sympathetic players to be the retailers and people who are addicted to nicotine. So it can separate the tobacco industry from retailers in that, you know, at the end of the day, the retailers are suing us because they're the only ones withstanding to sue us, but they have so much time to adapt to this change. It's the most gradual change to them and their business model. Um, and they have just gobs of time to adapt to it. It's not really a shock to their economic system at all. Meanwhile, to smokers, you know, the vast majority of smokers would like to not be smokers, um, and they would very much like for the next generation not to be smokers, but they, but outright bans cause panic among people because uh, tobacco is just so addictive. So addiction is a part of the business model for the tobacco industry. They need young people to be addicted, to become addicted. If you don't become addicted to tobacco before you're 25, you never will. So they really need a younger generation as part of their business model and they need addiction. But the tobacco free generation law also uses addiction in its own, in, in, in flipping it around and saying, look, if you're already addicted, this format of regulation is designed to leave you alone. And it's designed to really focus on trying to prevent future users becoming addicted, which is the business model. So it's powerful in that sense. Um, I mean, we were sued. And I think if you think about the impact on the businesses that there's no explanation for that other than that the tobacco industry really saw the threat if this were to become uh, bigger. And then, um, you know, Mark's organization um, won the lawsuit so far. Um, I think I could kind of stop there just, you know, as the, to, to give that overview. I mean, I, I could say a lot about our internal politics, but I think the really important thing is that any town that does this, um, anyone could go beyond their boundaries. Uh, and so the, the efficacy at stopping future addicts is not as great, but we, we are in a position to, to, to work out the litigation legality issues. And the larger the jurisdiction, the better. The fact that California's interest in this is incredibly powerful. The fact that New Zealand is interested in it is incredibly powerful and you know, hasn't been implemented yet, but will be soon. Um, those things are all very important, um, but we are, we're sort of planting a flag. Um, and um, 
you know, hoping that it, hoping that things grow. Well, thank you for that, Professor Silbal. We're going to circle back to you in a moment, but you did raise something that I feel I want to bring Kelsey in this conversation to, to start opining on a bit as well. Firstly, Kelsey, if you could give a bit of a of an overview of what what this even looks like. What what is this type of tobacco free generation policy uh, that Professor Sobal was referencing? There's a history there that I think would be advantageous to any community that is considering modeling a policy off of what Brookline or New Zealand or California or anyone else might be doing. Uh, and maybe you can uh, start by just speaking a little bit to that. Sure. So um, I'm Kelsey Romeo Steffi. I'm the managing attorney at Action on Smoking and Health. And I work more broadly on sort of global tobacco control. Uh, so I'm coming at this from more of a big picture view uh, as opposed to the nuts and bolts. Um, but I first heard about tobacco free generation as sort of an academic concept, an academic article that was being kicked around. Um, the first time I really remember it being brought up a lot was at the World Conference in 2015. Um, and I think the first academic article came out of Singapore, which has um, a lot of very restrictive laws. So people took took the proposal with a grain of salt based on where it was coming from, which often happens in international law. You have to think about what what the country that is is suggesting it is really saying. Um, but I think part of why the global tobacco control community took interest in this so quickly was the simplicity. Um, it's just so easy to say January 1st, 2000, that's the date you're looking for. If that's not it, you can't buy it. Um, and I think that really resonated. Uh, we have a lot of very effective tobacco control laws. Um, I don't think any of them are quite as simple as this one. And until we get to a straight up commercial ban of sales, uh, I think everything else allows for a little bit more wiggle room. And um, and then sort of on the flip side of that, I think tobacco-free generation is interesting because all of the places that have considered it so far are doing it a little bit differently. Even though it's simple, um, we can talk about New Zealand later. I don't wanna to get too far ahead of ourselves, but their laws being proposed very differently um, then Brookline, it has more components, it has more things happening. So it's both very simple and customizable. And I think that's what makes it so interesting. Where, where would you, uh, where would you see TFG, Kelsey, uh, and also uh, Professor Silva, where would you see this policy in the, in the pantheon of tobacco control? Like, is it something that people should be working or could be working towards in their respective communities? Is it uh, a, a modular sort of thing as Kelsey was just uh, describing that maybe some communities would uh, adopt and other communities would do something else? Uh, is it an either or, or is it an and, I guess, <laughs> a way of thinking about that. I have, I mean, it's, this is, it's a, I think the genius of the policy, the real genius of the policy is that it is a slow burn but it looks like a slow burn and it looks like a slow burn to, to people who might not pay very close attention to it, but I think it could have a very, very rapid impact. So here's the process. When Mark's finished um, you know, winning, winning and winning and winning these, this litigation, other towns in Brooklyn and in Massachusetts adopt it and then the state adopts it and, the, and California adopts it because those are both forward-looking public health states, you know, with with leader governors, and um, and once those two states do, uh, eventually the the federal government leans into it. A couple of other states come along, and the federal government leans into it. So that's my dream, and I think it's you know again, uh, it's such a slow it's it has such a slow appearance that um, I think it's a realistic dream. I, I agree. I love the slow burn aspect of it. I think that's very helpful. Um, we like to talk about the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the FCTC, the Tobacco Treaty, as um, a menu, not a recipe. So it's not you have to do all these precise things. It's you get to order a few things and mix and match and make it your own way. Um, and I think that TFG is a great component of the menu. Uh, I think it's an entree. I think it's an important one. I think it's a big step forward. 
but I think it's an and. I think other things need to go with it. We don't want to forget about adult smokers, for example. We need cessation support in there too. Um, so I think it's a great big step forward and part of the menu. I'll uh, address one of the questions that we already received uh, because I feel like it, it just fits in naturally to, to where, we're, uh, where we're at right now in this conversation. Uh, Professor Silva, uh, what, what is Brookline's uh, definition for tobacco and tobacco products? Does it include e-cigarettes? Yes, uh, it's nicotine for us. It's nicotine and I think the nicotine free I understand that that uh, I understand what the issues are, but uh, I think the nicotine is important to 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 the philosophy that makes tobacco free generation important, which is that you're just trying to reduce the number of addicts. You're trying to reduce the forward looking people with addiction um, because they're that's what supports the market. And um, so nic so the nicotine is you know it's that's how we structured it and it's important. But I think California is just it, the the bill as I understand it is just tobacco. Um, I also think that though this is, again, I agree it's part of a menu, um, the, if this policy works, you won't have as much of a threat of a black market because you only have a black market where you have a need. And if you can get rid of the need, you're not going to have as, you know, that that is, you're going to start out of the gate with less of an issue. So I'll jump in there then with one of the other questions that we received, uh, and we're receiving quite a few in the webinar chat, so this is great. Uh, and actually, there are two questions, and one of them, I think, is a, it's a natural step forward from what I was just hearing from you, Professor Silball, as well as uh, Kelsey, uh, when it comes to the slow burn, uh, that this is a policy that really its benefits we wouldn't start seeing at least for a decade, uh, as Professor Sobal was uh, intimating, in a maybe more, uh, I don't wanna say jaded, but in, a, in another way of looking at it, we might not see it for several decades. The premise being that we create a cordon around a birth date, around a generation and everyone born after that generation. And that population is legally never in a position to whom tobacco products may be sold. And then we have the other class of people who are born before that particular date for whom tobacco products may be sold and may, you know, may already be consuming them. And so if we have a long game like that, what are the chances that a policymaker, much like yourself, Professor Silbaugh, in five years, 10 years, in 30 years, tries to just repeal the the work that was done or repeal the 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 measure before some of that work really gets actualized and also uh maybe kelsey you can speak a little bit to this as well how do we conceptualize that cordon that that this is the group that is protected and this is the group that is not separated by january 1st and december 31st in some arbitrary year Kelsey, do you want? <laughs> uh, I'm not exactly sure the conceptualizing part. Neil, can you ask ask it in a different way, maybe? Sure. Is there an equal protection concern for having people born up until December 31st, 2000, whatever, and people born January 1st, 2000, whatever, afterwards, one group is protected under the law, or you know, restricted, you could say, under the law, and the other one is not. Well, I'm an attorney, but I'm more of an international advocate, so I'm going to leave that to the real lawyers. Um, I think that one's for Mark or Chris. But that doesn't worry me, I just want to say. That issue doesn't worry me. <laughs> that is, in fact, one of the uh, arguments that the retailers have made in the legal challenge uh, to Brookline's bylaw, um, that this is an equal protection issue. And, um, you know, the... The standard here uh, for uh, an equal protection uh, concern is um, the rational basis standard of review, which means that um, that the re the restriction, the government action, um, just has to be rationally related to uh, to a government purpose, um, which is a very very low um, standard to meet. And and in fact, you know, the government purpose here is to protect the generation, the next generation and subsequent generations of, uh, of uh, residents of Brookline 
from nicotine addiction. And, you know, that's actually a fairly compelling um, government interest here. Um, I, I think, and, and maybe uh, maybe uh, my colleague, Chris, who has done all the heavy lifting on uh, defending this case, I should say, although I, I, I appreciate the accolades, Professor Silbo. Um, you know, uh, the, um, the uh, in its appeal, the um, retailers um, have, uh, are emphasizing that, in fact, these are uh, these people who were um, uh, born um, uh, after um, uh, January 1st, 2000, should have some sort of special legal protection. Um, Chris, do you care to elaborate on, on, on their argument there? <laughs> they were described as ignoble, <laughs> this particular population. Uh, I, I just want to, it, it, after um, to returning to the, the um, rational basis test and, and the notion of equal protection, um, it, it, and this is, we've seen this play over in litigation in many states and federal and state courts, that smoking is not a fundamental right. There's no heightened level of protection for, for smoking. So it is subject to basic business regulations, which means that we have this lowest level of review, this rational basis test. So, you know, yes, this uh, birthday, and I love that term, I haven't heard it before, the birthday uh, uh, restriction creates two cohorts. Um, divided by age. Yes, that's that's true. Or birthday, not age, birthday. Uh, but there is no uh, heightened level of, of, of scrutiny um, that would bring about an equal protection concern. And, you know, as I said before, that's not just Massachusetts. Um, that's, that's in other states and, and nationally and in, in federal courts. I, would, I can't imagine there'd be a heightened level of, of scrutiny uh, on the equal protection argument. Well, Mark, no matter Chris, how many times it's raised by the uh, the plaintiffs in in this action, yes, it's, it's raised in every tobacco control lawsuit I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm just going to briefly pause there to say that this is a fantastic opportunity to reintroduce Mark and Chris, who are the counsels for who are defending and still aren't defending uh, Brookline's policy in Massachusetts courts. That might still be uh, a direction that they have to go in for a while. And I just want to like, let's just segue directly into that then, because with Kelsey and Professor Silbaugh really just explaining that this is a one line statement in a city's or a county's um, ordinances or even a state's laws to say that, you know, here's the birth date after which no one of this category people may uh, be an eligible consumer for a tobacco product or a nicotine product. I'm gonna. I have a question for my colleague Willow that I'm going to raise to the group about vernacular. Uh, but just to keep it within the legal argumentation uh, mindset that we're in, what what are what what can we expect? What can the people on this call, if they were to do this in their communities, what can they expect to hear, Mark and Chris and Kelsey as well, from the international experience you have from the industry and like whether it's a legal argument or if it's puffery uh, or threats uh, coming from big tobacco, like what should we be prepared for if uh, a community were to start going down the same line that Brookline has? Uh, I can, Mark, I'll, I'll jump in first and Kelsey, I'll take a shot at the main argument put forth by the plaintiffs in this case and um, the plaintiffs are a few retailers in town. Their main argument is one of preemption. So, in other words, this local law, bylaw, uh, they claim is preempted by state law. So, let me just pause there and emphasize the importance of making sure good local policy is not preempted. So the industry has made a practice, and not just this industry, but other industries have made a practice of sticking in preemption at the state level to stop good local action. Um, and uh, so that I know that probably many of the people on the call have dealt with that for years, whether they have preemption now or stopping preemption. So here we go. They did that. Um, 
uh, when we raise the age statewide from 18 to 21. Uh, luckily, uh, the limits, uh, the preemptive scope of this state law are modest. And um, in our eyes and, and in the court's eyes, in the trial court's eyes, do not preempt uh, uh, the Brookline bylaw. But that's their main argument. And I think that's the argument that would be uh, uh, raised uh, as, a, as a sort of the main thrust of in, in any state. That would be my suggestion. So. Uh, and I'll just add, it may, in fact, be insurmountable in, uh, in, in, in some jurisdictions. So this is probably the most important thing to check in terms of the state of the law um, before proceeding with a phase out to a total ban on tobacco sales or nicotine product sales. Um, in our case, the, um, the state law, which was a, a great state law that also included the uh, ban on all tobacco sales in pharmacies and, and other good provisions, did include a very um, daunting um, preemption clause. And, and it said, um, this act shall preempt, supersede, or nullify any inconsistent, contrary, or conflicting state or local law relating to the minimum sales age to purchase tobacco products. That sounds like it would be really problematic. Fortunately, um, and at the behest of, uh, of, of, of someone on, uh, on, on, on this webinar panel, there was some additional language inserted at the end of that paragraph that said, this act shall not otherwise preempt the authority of any city or town to enact any ordinance, bylaw, or safety regulation that limits or prohibits the purchase of tobacco products. So, this was the this is really the the main thing that the the retailers could um, glom onto uh, in their legal challenge. And very fortunately uh, for us, and this is a, sort of a byproduct of this interesting um, town meeting format that Brookline has, and many other communities in in Massachusetts and in, in in throughout New England have this town meeting format with this, you know, um, large number of citizen legislators. Um, the, uh, there's a safeguard there, which is that if they pass a bylaw or amend a bylaw, it needs to be approved by the state attorney general's office to ensure that it doesn't conflict with state law. And um, the state attorney general here in Massachusetts um, did find that, um, that it was not preempted after having reviewed letters and memos that were submitted by the uh, by the retailers and and um, by by our group and by Ash as well, um, they the uh, the attorney general's office independent independently found that um, it was uh, that the any preemptive effect only would impact any local law that tried to create a minimum sales age below twenty one. Not above 21, and and of course we would argue and have argued this isn't a minimum sales age approach. Um, this is a a birthday uh, restriction or a birth date restriction, um, and it's a phase out and a total ban on sales, and not just saying that you know you have to be a certain age to be able to um, buy these products. It's a slow phase out. The um... So the minimum age and the way one of the ways we've differentiated is to think about the fundamental difference between a minimum age sales law and TFG. Uh, uh, and the minimum age sales law is, in, a, in essence, an assumption of risk. And it basically asks, at what age do you want your children to start smoking? And, and that's uh, in that line, I'll give that one to Richard Daynard, a professor at University, the Northeastern Law School. Uh, but it really uh, uh, gets to the point here. Uh, people can become addicted at any age, most at younger ages, but they can be, the nicotine is dangerous at any age in the addiction. And so uh, uh, are we handling that addiction, responding to that in a good public health way by saying, you know, assumption of risk, here you go, you're old, you're fine. Uh, or is it better to deal with it like the many hundreds of thousands of other products that 
local jurisdictions or state jurisdictions or the federal government have decided, look, this is particularly dangerous. We're not, we're going to phase this out. Um, and you, there are thousands and thousands of examples. Uh, and so it's, it's uh, changing the way we approach this from an antiquated sort of assumption of risk to a, a more evidence-based, this is a dangerous product, let's phase it out and phase it out in a way that doesn't punish those who are addicted. Well, Chris, I'm going to jump in there because I think you used uh, the operative word punish. And I, I want to uh, I want to play devil's advocate with a very familiar argument from the tobacco industry, but also to think about who are the people who are currently using these products and how might a law like this affect them? So uh, to wrap those together with a neat bow, the very common argument that the industry and its uh, allies put forth is that ultimately it's an individual's choice if they start using a tobacco product or nicotine product uh, and it's their choice if they continue to use those products in spite of the risk, having assumed the risk by initiating in the first place and uh, continuing to assume the risk with their uh, sustained purchases. That's been the the argument from their side for 70 years, uh, but perhaps <laughs> perhaps it's worth just re-mentioning real quick uh, your thoughts, uh, Chris and, and Mark and anyone else, of course, on that particular uh, framing, the hyper-individualized uh, notion about tobacco product consumption and maybe how it affects people. And thinking about punish as well, Chris, one of the uh, attendees asked this question about PUPS, uh, purchase use and possession uh, laws. And we at Public Health Law Center are on record and we encourage in our model policies that these should be removed, that laws uh, for tobacco control, all laws should be treated as civil matters uh, with whatever, you know, maybe some, a few exceptions, but incredibly few and, and highly constrained exceptions. It should be a civil matter dealt in civil courts, particularly when it comes to retailers and retailer compliance and things of that nature. With something like a, a birth date cutoff uh, for the uh, purchase or the lawful uh, sale to uh, for these products, are there concerns that a law like this in 10 years or in, in 20 years could take on a an air of uh, punishment that we would not want to see? Uh, let me just a quick clarifying point. This does not punish possession. It prohibits sales. Uh, we've been very careful in Massachusetts to um, there's no punishment for possession. And that's across the board in our tobacco flavors, menthol, which we ban statewide, um, possession by youth. We don't, in sc schools they take away, but we don't punish that. We we prohibit the sale for the exact reason you said. Um, getting to the, and I'll just, let me just throw a first quick opinion in there, and then I'm interested to hear from my panelists. Uh, the industry has been using that personal responsibility argument for for decades across the board in in just on everything they do and i don't know how many hundreds of millions of americans have died during that time so uh, you know i would suggest who is not taking personal responsibility here and uh, and that be interesting to hear from my panelists on that i mean i'm sorry say, go ahead kate i'm oh, sorry just that the big the big distinction between tobacco and so many other issues of personal responsibility is that tobacco is addictive. So it just, you just can't subject an addictive substance or it just like shows so little understanding of how addiction works to subject it to that thinking. So here's would be my comparison. A 16 year old, an 18 year old, a 21 year old can sometimes ride a bicycle without a helmet and that's not good behavior. But by the time they're 23, 24, 25, they realize they value their head and they start to wear a helmet. But if they stop, if, if, if we're not wearing a helmet, we're the kind of thing, once you do it when you're 21, you can't ever stop not wearing a helmet. That's what tobacco is like. It's just completely different than other personal responsibility issues. There's no change in your mind. Right. We, you know, um, our, our organization also represents um, 
uh, smokers who have been injured or they uh, represent the families of uh, smokers who have died as a result of smoking caused disease. And when we talk about the addiction and choice issue, it's always it's almost inevitably this two part process where um, minors, almost always minors, are um, lulled through, um, you know, their their peers or marketing or a combination of that the environment in which tobacco products appear um, to be normalized and cool and part of adult life and they begin to experiment um, but very quickly they become addicted um, and then their ability to choose is completely compromised and for some people it's compromised for, for, for life and they're not going to be able to quit no matter how hard they try because their brains will never feel normal unless they're dosing with nicotine constantly. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a, a, a unique product and the idea of personal responsibility, really, I think we don't apply that the same way to um, really children whose brains have not matured uh, and fully developed in order to assess risk ac risks accurately and make those decisions that have lifelong consequences. But we all know that. I'm going to uh, continue this uh, this thread, and I'm going to again play the devil's advocate uh, for a brief moment, Kelsey. I want to bring you in on this because you mentioned, uh, rightfully so, a lot of your work in the international space, and particularly with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, uh, which the U.S. assigned but is not a member to. Uh, however, it's in that forum that the tobacco industry is also particularly vocal when it comes to how should the tobacco treaty. Uh, be thought of, how should it be implemented? And they fight tooth and nail over a lot of things. They fight, especially for not being included in the conversations. And one of the things that they fight the most about is harm reduction and their brand. Um, I'm using that word in, in several senses. Their brand of next generation, potentially harm reductive products. And I can imagine the tobacco industry uh, whether it's Philip Morris or uh, BAT or anyone else uh, saying, why, A, why should we have a law like this when we are producing the off ramp, or at least, you know, an off ramp to a, a side street uh, for the uh, quote unquote more harmful, uh, some might say just differently harmful, uh, combustible tobacco products that we also sell. And uh, what like, what does that mean for all the people who might want to use these products? And uh, why why would we want to approach uh, things in such a restrictive manner? So it sort of dovetails a little bit with the, the argument of individual freedom and choice and all that. But it does also get to something that I, I had mentioned uh, some moments ago about this being such a long-term policy really oriented around saving a generation of people born after say 2007. But then everyone before that birth date is still a, you know, in the, in the category of people that are using these products or could be using these products. And isn't there going to be some sort of backlash to them? So Kelsey, a very long context. But that, that's, a, that's a lot of things in one question, but let me start with the first I'm one. great at packing them in. <laughs> yeah. Let me start with the first thing of harm reduction. So the phrase harm reduction, you have to be reducing harm. So you have to be using these new products to quit smoking. So if you are advertising harm reduction products to people who are smoking, great, that's harm reduction. If you're selling it to people who have never smoked, that's not harm reduction. Um, so that is important to consider with the tobacco free generation as well. The second is the tobacco industry is, of course, not actually trying to get people to stop smoking entirely. Um, so we have to consider that as well. Um, and I would say from a international perspective, there's a lot of differing opinions in the U.S. on harm reduction. But when you look at the whole world, there is a ton of differing opinions. There's people, some countries have gone so far as to ban them and some countries really embrace them. Um, and this is going to be something we have to reconcile uh, with tobacco-free generation policies and with endgame policies in general. Um, it's different across borders. And in some places like in Europe, where crossing a border is, you know, walking down your street, 
that's going to be a very different thing that we need to think about. In the U.S., that's true with states, obviously, but um, internationally, when we have such a dichotomy of opinions, that's going to be something we need to resolve. Um, New Zealand's law is for combustibles only, um, and most of the ones I have seen that are being floated in, in international spheres seem to be focused on combustibles. And I think that's a, that's kind of a shame um, because, you know, I think that the future of the uh, recreational nicotine industry is uh, uh, addicting young people with non-combustible products. And, you know, I think one of the things that this policy, as it was articulated in Brookline, does is it just looks to um, eliminate nicotine addiction from future generations. And as to harm reduction, you know, that, that harm reduction has been a, such a divisive issue in public health uh, in, in regards to nicotine and tobacco products. But the tobacco-free generation or nicotine-free generation approach, um, I, I see as really a bright line between harm reduction and harm prevention with this approach on the harm prevention side exclusively, because ideally it should not affect um, any existing user's um, ability to use other off ramps. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I think that's one of the elegant things about this approach is it sort of sidesteps um, a lot of the uh, toxic debate uh, around harm reduction that has been, you know, part of the conversation around what are the um, the most effective and appropriate ways policies going forward. Hmm. So, Can I just add, I just would like to add, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I could not agree with Mark more that the, that, that you can have that harm reduction conversation when you're talking about outright bans, but when you're talking about a birth date restriction, you're focusing on people who don't use. So I just think it's not it's not an apt discussion. But since it's nicotine that's addictive, and since the mission is to sort of cut the addiction factor, which is the business model, you know, and and the thing that makes it so such an important public health problem, given that smokers basically don't want to smoke. I mean, if you don't cut that, then you're not really doing the work. And the nicotine vaping is addictive. I also just feel like anytime you talk about harm reduction, I, you know, we, we, we need to have medically supervised treatment for people who wish to, to cease using tobacco. And I assume in a world where tobacco it was impossible to access tobacco, there would still be medically supervised use of nicotine because there would have to be. I mean, we, that's what we do with other drugs that are addictive. And, and so I just, you know, it, get, don't vape, get a prescription, get some medical supervision. That's the story, right? I mean, and, uh, and, uh, uh, Neil, just before you jump in, sorry about that. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's Im important that uh, we realize that the tobacco free generation policy is not necessarily the be all end all of all tobacco policies. And it does not address the millions of current users of particularly cigarettes, which is, you know, the, obviously the most dangerous form of nicotine delivery. Um, and it is really complementary with all of the other um, range of policy options, whether they're sales restrictions, whether they're targeting, you know, flavors um, or, or, or where tobacco can be sold. All of those are part of it. Um, and this is really a, a backstop to make sure that future generations are not addicted to nicotine. And it's it's we don't mean in any way to be writing off all of the current users whose health uh, are is in jeopardy. Mark, you you went where I was going to uh, direct anyway. Actually, Kate, you did the same thing when I tried to overspeak you. So I'm glad we're all copacetic. Um, separated by distance and, and apparently nothing else. Let's let's stay in this vein uh, since we're transitioning towards the uh, the end of, of our conversation here. And let's think about the future. And we'll just start where you left off, Mark. We'll start with the idea that TFG, actually, I really love the idea, Kelsey, that you mentioned of like the 
FCTC just having a menu of items and like this this is this is the top us on the list uh, of things that cities and counties and states can consider they can do a TFG but then that still leaves 10 20 30 40 50 years of needing other types of tobacco control uh, to benefit people who are currently users or uh, who want to leave uh, or, or exit their addiction, as uh, Professor Silva was just saying. So let's let's think about what what are those other things that are available. One of the commenters asked if you, the panelists, could comment on uh, retailer reductions, re retailer license reductions, uh, as like a phase out in its own way of creating. Uh, uh, sales ecosystems where these products just wouldn't be easily available. Another uh, person from the chat had asked about online sales, and maybe we'll just start there, and I'll throw it to you all to jump in where you see fit. Well, uh, we have several towns and cities and towns in Massachusetts that have started on retailer reduction, and, and they all pretty much all are municipalities require a, uh, a license to sell tobacco products, any nicotine product. Um, and um, many of those municipalities cap the number of retailers in their town. One of the problems is, and we're just starting to look at this, is the density, sort of the clustering of retailers. And you find clustering of many more tobacco retailers um, in certain areas of towns, and it's an inequitable uh, um, result of, of, of our policy. So we're starting to look on really trying to deal with density. How do we respond to that? How do we avoid these clusters, this, this um, uh, um, sort of unjust exposure to um, the threat of that tobacco retailers pose and the advertising and promotion uh, that's uh, much greater in certain areas of our town. So that's one area that I would suggest um, that people think about as a complement to TFG. Um, we've already done flavor restrictions and and that that was a huge one for us. Um, um, and it went statewide. Prior to that, it was some towns. So those are the two I would suggest. I think flavor restrictions is, uh, and particularly um, uh, focusing on on menthol products, is um, uh, going to be a very impactful um, policy going forward at the local level or state level. Um, you know, I, I'm ho and perhaps the federal level. Let us let us hope. Um, I've been um, pleased that we have not really seen. Um, uh, marketing orders, approval orders uh, for um, menthol flavored um, e-cigarettes um, yet. And, you know, there it seems to be some momentum in getting um, menthol combustibles out uh, through uh, through the FDA. Um, but it much this is, these are very slow processes at the federal level. So it's going to be very important for um, other states. Um, besides uh, Massachusetts and California and um, and several others um, to uh, to move forward with these menthol restrictions and all flavored tobacco products because that is the huge on ramp for new users. We we in Brookline have a, a license end game um, system in place where the number of licenses is is set at the legacy licenses and they can only transfer with that business and that piece of property, but if you let it lapse, it's gone for good. That's the so old that's, cap that's and winnow. Hmm? Cap Pardon? and winnow, I think. Cap and winnow, it's, yeah. just, it's just basic transition policy, yeah. I, I don't wanna overextend the metaphor, but uh, if our menu, if we're in the entree box, I'd love to see us pick some from the dessert and the appetizers as well. Um, I think it's great that we wanna do all these tobacco control things, but I think it's also time that we start thinking a little outside of the box. Um, I think the environmental movement is a great way for us to make some progress with tobacco control. Um, we're seeing things about environmental endgame, environmental justice, um, things like tobacco product waste laws could tie in with uh, tobacco-free generation or other endgame policies. Um, with menthol cigarettes, we focused a lot on, on human rights of vulnerable populations and using international mechanisms 
to enforce that. So I think it's really exciting time in tobacco control because we're looking outside of tobacco control. Um, and I think TFG is, again, simple for other people who haven't been deep in tobacco control to understand. And it's a great way to bring in some new people and some new exciting ways to look at Endgame. Let's then wrap up this uh, conversation with uh, maybe just the idea of like, what, what, what would you want our audience, which includes a lot of academics uh, with names that I recognize uh, having uh, previous interactions with them, uh, and also people who work in the policy space, tobacco control programs, and, and the whereabouts. Uh, if each of you could just maybe take uh, one or two minutes and just really say like, this is this is the thing I want you to take away for uh, this, what we call tobacco-free generation, what could be called nicotine-free generation, if you want to expand it, or uh, to use uh, the nomenclature introduced to me today of, of like a birth date <laughs> based po uh, policy. And we'll start with you, uh, Professor Kate, like one or two minutes, final closing pitch, um, go. Yeah. So, um, so unlike Chris and Mark, even though I am an attorney, um, I, this is, I don't do this as legal work. Um, and so the thing I would emphasize to everybody is that you don't have to do everything in order to do something. And that there is no one who cannot participate in this particular issue at the local level. You can figure out how to participate in the local level. And I think it's incredibly, incredibly worthwhile place to work. And I think it's possible to sell to people around you as a neat solution to many problems, even if it isn't as big as a, as a prohibition it solves a lot of issues that matter to a lot of people who, who would have resistance to various kinds of regulation. And then the final thing I wanna say, in addition to thank you to uh, the Northeastern Center, um, is, is basically, I am willing to talk to anybody about this. I talk to people about it all the time. I meet with municipalities, I meet with public health departments, uh, you know, I get a random call from a small town in the middle of somewhere. And I cannot tell you how happy that makes me. And I, 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 my, my time is completely available to talk to people about how to do this because I think it's really, really worthwhile. Kelsey, what would you like to uh, add to that and uh, go further with? I think one thing I want to add is that this is happening. So we should convince our states and localities to get on board because it's coming. Um, so I think everybody wants to be first. It's a great advocacy pitch. You can be one of the first to do it, um, so they should. I wanted to talk really briefly about two international things that are happening. Um, one, there's a European citizens petition for TFG. Um, they're looking for a million signatures from at least seven different countries, and they have one year. It started in January, um, so that's at the EU level. So we might be looking next January at that, which would be very exciting. Um, and also the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control has its conference this year, um, and we will be talking about Endgame there. There's an Article 2.1 that allows for Endgame provisions, which would include TFG. So this will be entering the international sphere in a way that it never has before this year. Um, so again, to echo, if you're interested in that, Ash loves to talk to people. We're happy to help in any way or bring you into the international conversation if you'd like to get involved. So please feel free to get in touch. Mark. Um, I, I think the important thing, one important thing to take away is um, how quickly public opinion has evolved around end game strategies. Um, in in uh, uh, you know there was a, a recent um, survey that was published um, and, uh, and I believe it was a, a peer reviewed journal that found that now um, fifty seven percent of uh, of Americans uh, favor a complete ban on all tobacco products and a, a similar question in a twenty eighteen survey found that it was only about twenty five percent of Americans would support that. So it it what the public may be well ahead of 
academics, of program people, and certainly um, politicians and policymakers. But we need to be able to go forward with um, with with bold approaches. I think the nicotine free generation, tobacco free generation approach is a bold approach. Um, but it's not as bold as it so sounded um, ten years ago when we were first talking about it. That seemed like crazy talk ten years ago. That a, a total ban, a phased out total ban. I don't think that'll work, but you know, now it is something that I think is part of the discussion and it should be part of the discussion uh, in terms of those um, policy options. And, you know, as I think I mentioned, it's a, it's a really solid backstop for, um, for your tobacco policies. Um, and it doesn't do the whole thing it, it, and, and no one policy will, but it does provide hopefully some real insurance that you're not gonna have uh, further generations of uh, of of folks that are um, addicted to nicotine. And Chris, take us out. Uh, great. Well, Neil, thank you so much for moderating the discussion. And I want to thank um, my co-panelists. Um, this was great to be a part of the discussion, and it's great to be involved in this policy. You know, I, I, th this is the policy that, with mathematical clarity, um, provides a fair um, and smooth phase out of tobacco. And again, it, it's 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 not the end be all. It needs to be complemented with other policies, but it's it's a policy where um, people understand it. You know, your boots on the ground, people get this. And from what I've seen, people are passionate about it. They understand it. And um, it's a very winnable uh, and sustainable policy. Um, so I would definitely encourage the... Um, uh, attendees today to think about uh, looking to do this in your own in your, your own towns and cities and states. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, all of our panelists, for taking the time to have this conversation with myself, with each other, and with our audience. Thank you, audience, for taking the time to listen, uh, submit your questions. And I hope everyone has some good takeaways from this, particularly that this is the sort of policy that in the States we can do something with, we can go very far with, we can even go very fast with. Uh, we at Public Health Law Center are a legal resource to uh, many communities across the States. We're more than happy to be helpful. Our colleagues at ASH are equally willing and able and probably even more competent on many issues. And they're also happy to be uh, resources. We have our good friends at Boston and Northeastern who basically just invited themselves to any future conversation that any of you might want to have. And so by all means, let's keep these conversations going. Let's see if we can change the ground uh, and really make this of, of the century where we have put an end to tobacco and maybe even nicotine too, but we'll start at the very least with uh, that particular vernacular. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. <laughs>